very very good morning to all my viewers uh, welcome to the webinar series uh, we are conducting the series of the webinar in the parul university to get the best of the knowledge from industry expert to and to reach our student and other students of the university the industry expert of today dr shailendra nath rai sir uh, welcome sir thank you so i will just take a few minute to uh, for the introduction of our guests then we can start the webinar so uh, dr shailendra nath rai sir is currently chief manager in ongc with this limited and uh, posted as a country manager in vietnam The sir has worked in the ONGC Vidas Limited corporate management and business development and ONGC's laboratory services and offshore and onshore drilling services. So we have such a eminent personality, and the sir will be delivering the webinar on international oil and gas business and overview of ONGC Vidas Limited. So I am sure today our student will be enlightened by the inside view of the field. So, sir, I invite you to deliver the webinar. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jain, for a nice uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, Dr. Nagar, Mr. Jain, faculty member of Parul University, and dear students. I wish you all a very happy New Year. The COVID pandemic is now progressing at a very fast pace in India. So, I hope all of you and your near and dear ones are safe and in good health. It is indeed. it is indeed a matter of great pleasure and honor for me to interact with you young mind of the parul university our today top mr jain am am i audible yes sir you are clearly audible and your presentation is also clearly visible okay thank you very much so our today topic of interaction is international oil and gas business and a overview of ongc videsh limited so i would like to divide my interaction in five topic first i'll cover a little bit about inter international iron and gas business then acquisition of foreign assets here i will talk about how do we acquire oil and gas assets in international market and then i'll give you a overview of ovl activity and if time permits then ovl vietnam activity and the role of country manager in our overseas assets see the international oil and gas business is a very complex with different dimension and each dimension is a subject in itself so i won't go into every detail as we do not have that much time therefore my conversation will be only an overview as you know oil and gas are considered one of the most important resources of the world and will remain so for many decades even after the high growth in the renewable energy due to its easy transportation and storage especially crude oil can be stored for a 2 to 3 month consumption for whole country oil and gas easily transported through rail road or water but this is not the case with the renewable energy so this is the advantage of crude oil and gas over the renewable energy so due to this easy transportation and storage it will be a major source of energy for at least next to decade the oil sector is one of the important sector of the global economy and contribute about 2.5% of the global gdp it is a very important segment of the global economy and other sector of the economy also depend on this sector even a minor fluctuation in the price of petroleum affect almost every sector of the economy be it a manufacturing be it a transportation be it fmg since so since this petroleum is important resource every country wants to explore it in their territory but petroleum exploration and production are very cost intensive and it require high end technology which is often not available with the small companies and the developing countries therefore these countries depend mostly on the international oil company for petroleum exploration and exploitation because the ioc has the necessary resources and technology to do this work these oil international companies are generally known as oil majors so if i see the cost of exploration on an average 
the drilling cost of an onshore well is around 20 million dollar which is equivalent to 150 crore while drilling a well in a deep water it is around 60 million dollar which is comes which, which is equivalent to 450 crore this means if a company drill an onshore well and the well is dry the company will going to lose around 150 crores and if a small company drill two back to back dry well in a deep water it will go it will go to bankrupt as it will lose around 900 crore in just two well but one and one side it is a very costly affair but on the other side this business is very profitable also if they get success in the first well it will prove to be boon for the company and it will change the fortune of the company therefore oil and gas business are very risky business but high reward business here i i would like to share a recent success story of guena oil discovery in which you can see how cost intensive oil exploration is and how technology intensive is and if there is a success then what is the reward for it as you may be knowing guena is a very small country in latin america the total population is about 8 lakh i think which is one third of the world population and it is a developing country with meager resources the total gdp of the country in 2020 was around 5.7 billion dollar but this country signed a production sharing contract with the exxon mobil for the deep water block is in 1999 the water depth in the block is around 200 meter so you can imagine what level of technology should have been required to conduct the seismic survey and drain the well the cost of drilling was also very high as it is, it is a deep water and i've just informed you that in the deep water general well normal well cost is around 60 million dollar around 450 crore rupees so you can think about the cost of the drilling in the deep water and there are very few leaks available which can drill a well in 2000 meter water depth but exxon mobil is a very big company he has the resources also company drill a well in goena of south and made a oil discovery in 2015 after the first discovery Exxon Mobil made at least 20 discoveries in deep water of Guyana of South. And whatever inf information available in the public domain, the estimated recoverable reserve, reserve are more than 9 billion barrels of this discovery. If you can compare the size of discovery with the bomb, our uh, ONGC Bombay High Field, the Bombay High has total recoverable reserve around 5.8 5, 5 billion barrels. It means the current discovery is 1.5 times bigger than the Bombay High discovery. And the expected peak production from this discovery will be around 1.2 million barrel dollar per day in 2030, when it reaches its peak. If you compare the this production with our current Indian production, which is around 6 lakh, 6 lakh 50 thousand barrel, it is almost double. The, then, after comparing this with our Bombay High or Indian production, you can think about how big discovery this, this discovery is. Now, we will look at the cost of the development and uh, reward from this discovery. The total capex required for the development would be around $60 billion. This is about 15 times of the GDP of Guyana. Therefore, without the help of IOC, this discovery and production would not have been possible so from this, you can understand the impact of IOC on oil and gas exploration and production around the globe. Now we'll see the reward signs. The net present value for the contractor from this discovery will be around $42 billion. This is a net present value. And for government tech, it will be around $46.2 billion. So if I count the revenue, total revenue, it is a, this discovery will generate about $150 billion from the this asset. And the post-tax IRR for this discovery will be around 26.7%, which is a very good IRR for any, any project. So from this discussion so far, it seems that government need IOC for oil exploration and gas exploration. But for this, each country will have to engage international oil company for exploration and production of oil and gas according to its legal framework. 
as per the legal framework oil and gas exploration and should be governed by the law so accordingly each country had its own petroleum law which define to whom and how the contract will be awarded and what type of contract will be used in the country for petroleum exploration petroleum law also define regulatory authority and operating procedure just like in india we have dgs director general of hydrocarbon dgh was established in 1993 under the mopng and the main role of dgh is to regulate the petroleum industry in india and similarly every country has a petroleum law and petroleum regulator and there uh, the regulator of the country regulate every affairs of the petroleum business in that country so so far we have discussed about the importance of ioc and how the petroleum industry is regulated now we will see what are the different type of contract in the petroleum industry which are used globally so there are broadly three types of contract that are in practice globally one is concession this is also called a royalty and tax regime second is production sharing contract and third is the risk service contract first we will see the concession this is the earliest form of the contract and prior to 1962 it was the only contract arrangement available for the exploration and production of hydrocarbon so concession agreement actually is a grant extended by government for a specified period to permit a company to explore develop produce hydrocarbon within a strictly defined geographical area contractor bears all exploration risk development and production cost and in return contractor gets produce oil or gas after deducting royalty royalty goes to government of the host country royalty are unproduced petroleum generally range from 7% to 20% depending on the volume of the production in some country it can be even higher also it totally depend upon the regulatory uh, regulatory procedure of the country this means royalty start from a minimum and increases with the increase in production of the volume for example you can see we up to 20000 barrel per day royalty will would be around 7% and after that it will increase according with the increase of the production in the concession agreement government also get milestone based bonuses and taxes on the profit of contractor milestone based means when total production from the field reaches at some milestone say 100 million barrel or 200 million then government gets some production bonuses also as per the contract as per the signed concession contract if i summarize the regarding the contract contractor take and government take out of this concession agreement so out of this concession agreement contractor get that uh, produce petroleum after deducting royalty and title of the crude is transferred to contractor on wellhead title of, this is the most important thing he took on the wellhead contractor is uh, eligible to export that oil from wellhead itself so there is no need to bring that oil to shore contractor authorized after deducting the royalty everything belongs to contractor when the resource is inside inside the uh, reserve it belongs to country but once it is at wellhead it belongs to contractor and government receive royalty on the produced petroleum production bonuses and tax on the profit of the contractor so this is about the concession agreement which is applicable in the world world wide up next is the production sharing contract this type of contract is let's excuse me this type of contract is latest development and the first production sharing contract was signed in i think 1966 in indonesia so under production sharing contract it is a agreement between the contractor and government whereby contractor bears all the exploration this development and production cost and in the return contractor gets portion of the profit petroleum and contractor is allowed to recover the cost with a cap i'll explain in the next slide what is the cost with the cap and the main feature of this agreement are contractor is responsible for doing all the job like all the cost and technology for exploration production and uh, development 
and if there is a discovery if there is no discovery contractor will be not paid anything but if there is a discovery contractor pays royalty to government and then recover the cost of exploration development and production with a cap and remaining petroleum is referred as profit petrol which is further distributed between contractor and government on a graded production basis graded production basis means as per the increase of volume of the production as the production increases the proportion of the profit share of the government also increases accordingly and here title of the crude is transferred to the contractor at delivery point or the export point so there is a difference between concession agreement and production share agreement because in the concession agreement title of the crude is transferred at the well head but in production share in contract uh, title of the crude is transferred at the export point so here contractor have has to bring the produced petroleum at the source and then that export point and there he, he will get the title of the petroleum from there he can either send to their host country either or he can sell at the market price and exploration development and production equipment becomes uh, government property because the contractor has already recovered the cost so the whatever the equipment used for the exploration period production period and the development period that ownership from the uh, contractor to transfer to government because contractor has already re uh, recovered the cost of all this equipment from the produced petroleum i uh, here also in the pac also contractor pay tax on their profit this is just a schematic representation of distribution of revenue after discovery under the pac regime first you can see the from the produced petroleum Royal royalty is deducted from the total production at the rate mentioned in the PSC, whatever uh, rate is PSC, and that rate the uh, uh, royalty is deducted from the total uh, produced petroleum, and it goes to government. And remaining petroleum further distributed into two part. One is the cast petroleum, and second is the profit petroleum. Cast per petroleum is capped as per the petroleum law of the host country. Here you can see the cast petroleum varies from 50 to 70. For the normal pro uh, normal project, generally it is around 50 percent. Normal project means onshore project and shallow water project, and 70 percent in deep water project. And generally, it is fixed by the petroleum law, law of a host country. So this is the which was which we I was talking about the cap on the cost of oil. So this is a 50 to 70 percent is cap. He, Contractor can only recover the cost up to 50 to 70 percent in that particular area, and if the cost is more than that, then the remaining cost will be uh, carried forward to next year for the recovery again with the cap. And contractor is allowed to recover total cost unless it is finished. And after the cost petroleum, this profit petroleum again divided into two parts. One is the contractor profit petroleum and uh, other is the government profit petroleum. Uh, this is also based on the already executed PSC. The percentage already in the part of the PSC. So part profit petroleum also divided into two parts. The, the, one is the contractor profit petroleum and again, uh, other is the government profit petroleum. And out of the contractor prof profit petroleum, he pays corporate income tax to government and remaining with the contractor. This is just an example how the profit, uh, profit, uh, profit petroleum is uh, dis uh, distributed between contractor and uh, uh, government. Initially, up to certain uh, volume, it is 50-50. And as the volume of production increases, the government sell al also increases along with the volume of the production. And why does this happen? Because the resource of the country belongs to the nation. And that's why, therefore, maximum profit should go to the state. And this, this that is why it is distributed like this, and and this all this thing is a part of the PSC. So if I summarize regarding the contract, contractor and government take under PSC, so contractor take under the PSC is cost petroleum and contractor profit petroleum, and title of the cost petroleum and profit petroleum transfer at the export point. In the concession, it was transferred at the well head, but in the PSC, it is transferred at the export point. And government under PSC is royalty, government share of profit petroleum, and corporate income tax. Next and third one is the risk service contract. 
risk service contract is a contract whereby a host nation who is lacking the technical capability to de develop its oil asset or does not want to put its money in the risky exploration business award a contract to an uh, oil company to explore develop and produce from the asset and in exchange of the services the host country pay pays a pre agreed service fee to the contractor in case there is a commercial discovery and production here also if there is no commercial discovery contractor will get nothing so this is a very risky risky type of contract and this contract is generally con uh, international kind of following uh, in the development and production not in the exploration because exploration itself is a very risky risky venture and they do not want to put all their money in the risk to the risk so main feature of the risk service contracts are contractor has no right on the title of the produced petroleum it belong to the government so in the other two contractor uh, other two type of contract concession and pac contractor has right on the produced petroleum in concession just after deducting royalty everything belong to cont uh, contractor in pac cost oil and profit petroleum but in the service contract there is no right of right on the title of petroleum for the contractor contractor get only a pre agreed service fee per barrel of the produced oil equivalent so in this type of contract contractor gets only a pre defined pre agreed service fee just few dollar per barrel and surface surface fee is not dependent on the price of the oil or gas it is fixed for whole tenure of the contract and sometimes this fee is also taxable so this type of contracts is followed in very few country in middle east one is iran ongc videsh has also has one project in iran under the same risk service contract and obl has made a big gas discovery also in that block and that block is under negotiation for development and production it still deal is has to be finalized it is still under negotiation this is a comparison of different type of contract just a summary which already we have discussed concession contract is globally followed 40 44% country follows the concession type of agreement 48% countries follow pac and very few country follow the risk service contract and this contract is applicable for all type of concession is applicable for all type of uh, project like exploration development and ur project pac is also applicable for all RAC is also applicable for all type of project, but often contractor not interested during the exploration period because of the risk, and the reward is not commensurate with the risk. That's why the uh, international oil company are not interested to go to RAC for exploration stage. They certainly want to go at the development or the production stage. Petroleum entitlement, as I have already discussed, seventy to eighty percent. Uh, in concession belongs to contractor in pac it is 50 60% and in rsc there is no right on the petroleum entitlement of the contractor remaining ownership of the equipment ownership of the equipment in concession is with the international oil company because it in this type of contracts there is a cost cost recovery is not allowed but in pac since cost recovery is allowed the ownership of the equipment transferred from the contractor to the government and rsc it is with the government lifting entitlement entitlement as we have already discussed the gross production minus royalty belongs to the contractor in pac it is cost oil plus profit oil and in rsc since there is no entitlement so no lifting right also for the contractor title transfer of the petroleum in concession title is transfer at the well head in pac it is at export point but in rsc it is not applicable because there is no right on the petroleum financial obligation in all the three sides all the financial obligation is the contractor if i we talk about the government control so pac and rsc government control is very high but in concession government control is very low so so far we have discussed 
importance of ioc and why ioc are required for exploration development and product production of petroleum and what are different type of contract in practice globally now we will see how these oil and gas fields are acquired in international market the now the question arises that how does the interested ioc ioc means international oil company or national oil company know that such property are available in the market in the first place so what is the source of information the these are the four sources of information through which any company can know assets are available in the market the first is the bidding round all the countries who want to engage the international oil companies for exploration and production of the oil and gas run a open bidding rounds open bidding round means any any interested company can apply in that bidding round there is no bar and in this bidding round any company interested in fully filling the pre qualification criteria can apply even host country organized road show so that more and more bidder can get to know that uh, there is a bidding process and the information are also available on the public portal of the regulator just like in india on the side of the dgh as well other public portal also which are the pet public portal like uh, utmac ihs these informations are available second source is the farm out process farm out process suppose a company has a asset and wants to sell a part of a asset or a whole asset they run a farm out process through the investment bankers and they notify the, the process through a public portal like utmac ihs and through other sources ki they are running a process to farm out their existing asset either in the part or in the whole so any company who is interested in fulfilling the pre qualification criteria can apply in the in two these two sources i have mentioned a pre qualification criteria this pre qualification criteria is just a matter to shortlist the ioc so that only those company can apply who have the requisite financial power and who have the required technical capability to perform the job so host country are the asset owner who is uh, doing the farm out process can put certain financial and technical condition so that only those company can apply who has operated a minimum some deep water project or they can put some financial condition ki company uh, turnover of the company should be more than this amount this type of condition they can put in the pre qualification criteria so that only those company can apply who have the requisite technical capability as well as the financial financial capacity to perform this work because they are very cost intensive and intensive or very technical high end technical technology is required to do the drilling survey or any job in the petroleum industry that they don't want to allow all the company to participate and just increase the number of bid second one is one to one negotiation as the name suggests company directly approach to other company for sale of asset either in the part or whole and fourth one is some country offer block to national oil company of the friendly nation also so here there is no uh, process just there is a one to one government to government deal so this type of deal is also happen in the international oil market in all the four process of how the bid is evaluated and how the bid uh, bidder has applied to the market we can discuss in all these four process interested bidders get available technical information either free of charge or on chargeable basis and the information about the applicable physical regime in that country technical data means uh, seismic data there may be 2d data 3d data or drilled well information in the form of report in that block and physical re regime means what type of applicable uh, what type of contracts are applicable in that country and what is the cost petroleum cap and what are the applicable taxes so that this information can put in the economic model and economic model can be run on the basis of this information so based on this technical information interested bidder first evaluate regarding the prospectivity of the asset 
and estimate the size of resource. First, the uh, bidders has to see whether this opportunity is at prospective or not prospective. If prospective, then how much how how much the size of reserve or resource, jo, whatever is available. And after technical evaluation, if the assets fits fits the company criteria. The company runs a financial model to find out whether the asset is technically and commercially viable or not. I mentioned company criteria. Company criteria means every com company has a certain criteria. They will going to bid for a asset who have a certain amount of reserve. Like in, if I can uh, quote for NGC Videsh, so we have a certain criteria that we will only bid the asset who have. 50 million barrel of oil or oil equivalent gas in onshore and 200 million barrel of oil and oil reserve in offshore. So this is the criteria below that we will not apply for that asset. So like this, every company has certain criteria. If the asset fit into that criteria, they apply, otherwise they don't apply. Now we'll see how the bid is submitted and evaluated. So every bid has two parameters. One is biddable parameter and other is non-biddable parameter. Non-biddable parameter are generally the parameter which are which are fixed by the petroleum law. So there is no negation. Simply bidder has to comply with the non-biddable parameter. And there are two or three biddable parameter in the bid. One is the work commitment. And second is financial commitment and offer to government and profit petroleum. So in work commitment, company can propose to do certain GNG study during certain period, some seismic work, and to drill a number of, to drill a well. And company has to specify the time also, okay? in which time they will do the GNG study, they will do the seismic survey, and the, they will drill the well. And for each activity, company has to give us some financial figure you will expend this much money for GNG study and this much money for suspect work and this much money for drilling a well. But you can note one point that these financial commitment are legally binding commitment. So company has to be very careful when giving the financial commitment. If Because if company fail to perform its work of commitment during a specified period of time, then he must pay the penalty to the host government equivalent to the financial commitment. And third biddable parameter is offer to the government. Here company would have to propose that what percentage of profit petroleum they are going to give to government. And on this biddable parameter, each bid is evaluated and bid is awarded to the highest bidder. And by this way, companies acquire the asset in the international market. So this is about uh, international higher and I have just given a summary. Next, I'll talk about uh, OBL. So this is a brief about OBL. As you've seen, OBL, ONGC Videsh is a 100% subsidiary of India's national oil company, ONGC, and engaged in international ENP business. OVL was first incorporated as Hydrocarbon Private India Limited in 1965, but there were no many activities till 1989. In 1989, to boost the international ENP business, Hydrocarbon India Private Limited was renamed as ONGC Videsh Limited. And after that, there was no looking back. Now ONGC Videsh are in 15 countries with 35 projects. And in between, we have relinquished number of projects after initial GNG study or after expiry of the contract based on their prospectivity. Production from ONGC with this asset during the 2020-21 was around 2,50,000 barrel per day, which is almost 22% of our national product production. The 2P and 2P reserve of ONGC with this is around 490 or 409 mm2 as on 1st April 2021. And this shows, this reserve shows that, that ONGC Videsh can produce at the same rate 
a few years more. This is growth story of the ONGC Videsh. It is started in 1965, as I mentioned, and first phase was uh, the beginning from 1965 to 1988. There are not much activities. Actually, actual journey of OVL started after acquisition of Vietnam asset in 1988. Second phase was the period of initial growth. This period was from 2001 to 2004. Uh, during this phase, ONGC and OVL both was led by one of our stalwart or legendary chairman, late Mr. Subir Raha. During his time, he had given free hand to OVL management to acquire good producing assets so that OVL can generate enough revenue to expand in future. And during this period, OVL acquired very good producing assets like Sakhalin, Myanmar, Sudan, and Syria, which are paying dividend till today. Third period was the period of expansion from 2006 to 2014. And during this phase, OBL acquired very good exploratory and developing asset for organic growth of the company because company can only grow organically if they acquire ex good exploratory asset and make discovery. Because producing asset is not that much rewarding, exploration and development, de development assets are risky but they are re good reward also. So for growth of organic growth of a company, it is required to have a very good high impact exploratory asset as well as asset under development. Fourth phase, definitely 2016 onward. And during this, OVL, OVL focus is just to purchase a good producing asset as well as high impact uh, exploratory asset. So this is about the growth of ONGC with this from 1965 to till date. This is our global footprint. OVL has presence, as I have told, OVL has presence in 15 countries through 35 project. And out of this 35 project, project 14 are producing, 4 are under development, and 14 are under exploration, and 3 are pipeline project. Out of these 14 exploratory assets, we have made discovery in two or of asset. One is in Brazil and other in CPO5 block in Colombia. If I talk about administrative control, then uh, OBL is divided into five business units. One is Russia, second is Asia Pacific, then Mozambique, Middle East and North America and LSC. So in Russia, we have three producing assets. Imperial, Sakhalin, and Bangkok Neft. In Vietnam, we have one producing asset and one exploratory asset. Myanmar, again, we have two producing, two exploratory, and two pipeline. Bangladesh, we have two exploratory asset. And currently, uh, drilling is going on, and we are expecting a very good discovery in Bangladesh very soon. In Mozambique, we have a very high value asset which is under development and production from this asset is expected in 2026, around 2026. In Syria, we have one asset under development, one under production. Iraq, we have an exploratory asset. Iran, again under development. Azerbaijan, we have a one producing asset and one pipeline. Libya, we have one exploratory asset. UAE have producing asset. South Sudan, two producing asset, and again, Venezuela, one exploratory asset, one under development, and Brazil, there is one asset under produce production, and one is under dis, uh, exploration, and there is a big discovery, which is going to be converted very soon in the producing asset, and in Colombia, again, we have six exploratory asset and one producing asset. So this is our global foot footprint. This slide shows the strength of OVL as a credible international oil company. In oil industry, companies are recognized based on the credible operatorship of the asset. And ONGC Videsh has proven its credential by operating 18 projects, 12 of its own and 6 in the joint venture. So currently we are operating in 18 projects. 
and this operatorship of an oil asset is often a PQC for international bidding round also. So with this operatorship in twin country, now OPL is eligible for bidding any any bidding round in around the world. So this is our credible credibility. This slide shows the production profile of the OBL. In 2002 3 our production was 0 0.25 MMT, and in 20, 1920, 20, 1920, it was 15 metric ton. I live over in, which is almost 60 times in 13 years. Production from 2021 was little bit less than 1920, but it was not because of the production capability. It was due to cut a production by OPEC and Russia to stabilize the international iron market. This slide shows obvious growth of reserve on a year and year basis. OBL reserve was 214 mm TOE in 2002-3 and now it is 495 mm TOE despite of every year increase in production. This shows our reserve. This is a financial performance of OBL. OBL has always performed well financially since its inception. The profit after tax of OVL has always been positive, except one year in 1516. And last year, our profit after tax was around 1980 crore. This is the financial performance. And this, this slide shows the performance on, on MAU parameter. Actually, MOPNG signed MAU with all the PSU and based on the that MAU, they access the performance of PSU on already signed MAU parameter. OVL MAU rating has been excellent in the last five years, except 1718. It was very good. Otherwise, all the year it is excellent. And this is the our acquisition in last five years. AVL, OVL. In last five years, OBL has acquired three producing asset and two exploratory asset. Exploratory asset was in Namibia and Israel, and both the both has been relinquished after the GNG study e studies and uh, drilling a well. This is our future plan. ONGC has set a 2040 energy vision for the group company and under this vision they have set a target for OBL to achieve 40 mm TOE by 2040. So as per current production profile of the existing asset, the production of OBL will be around 15 mm TOE in 2040. It means OBL has to add additional barrel of 25 mm TOE either through acquisition of the producing asset our monetization from our own discovery, our new discovery from the exploratory asset, and OVL is trying hard to fill that gap as early as possible. This slide shows our OVL collaboration with leading international oil company. OVL is working right now, working with almost all the leading international oil company in the joint venture. We are with BP and Exxon Mobil in Azerbaijan. We are with Exxon Mobil and Rosneft in Sakhalin. Cell with Cell in Brazil. CNPC with South Sudan. So this is a, our partnership with the NOCs and IOCs. And I'll now, since time is very limited, I will briefly tell about the Vietnam project. In Vietnam, ONGC with us has two blocks. One block is 0.6.1, which is a producing block. And another, another block is uh, 128, which is under exploration. In exploratory block, we have already carried out seismic survey. And GNG study is going on at the headquarter. And very soon, we are going to drill a well in that block. 
and in block 061 is a producing block it is a very uh, promising block this block was acquired in 1988 and the license validity of this block is up to 2023 we have three partner in this block ongc videsh have 45% share and rosneft vietnam have 35% is a russian uh, oil major and petro vietnam have 20% which is a national oil company of vietnam for this project government of india has approved 572 million dollar for investment but so far ongc videsh has invested 565 million dollar and you can see the net cash flow till march 21 from this asset alone ovl has generated 1.137 billion net cash flow net cash flow it is a profit this block has already paid by 2000 six and after 2006 everything is a profit and the production since inception is 30.67 mmt this is the obl share only otherwise at the consortium level it is around 70 mmt last year our production was 1.32 1 bcm and we have a reserve balance reserve of 2.1 mmt as on 2021 which can be exploited in remaining 2 years of validity of this Uh, license and in this block last year we did did drill a well and we have made a discovery in the deeper classic section so we are under the negotiation with the vietnam government for the extension of psc so that we can develop that uh, discovery and we can continue in this block for further 15 to 16 year so that negotiation underway and i hope that will be be completed in my tenure only this block is a offshore block and it is situated south east from southern vietnam 370 km in the uh, sea this is a ncsp gas supply chain ncsp means namkhan san pipeline our block is situated in namkhan son basin that is this uh, pipeline is known as uh, namkhan son basin you can see block 061 is our block extreme in the east and in this basin there are three more blocks block 5.2 5.3 block 11.2 and block 12.2 and from our platform lante platform is our lante is our platform of block 061 and this pipeline goes from lante platform to dingo terminal this is a 370 km pipeline 26 26 inch and this is a dual pipeline dual pipeline since the gas and condenser both transported through this pipeline and this pipeline is the world longest dual phase pipeline after the reaching the gas at dingo terminal there is again pipe another pipeline of 28 km in 30 inch which goes to fumai gdc gdc means uh, gas distribution center and from there this gas is trans uh, sold to power plants and fertilizer and ho chi minh city and from dingo uh, dingo terminal there is one more pipeline of 25 km which goes to thimai terminal for condensate export so this is a ncsp gas supply chain this is the this this is the development story of the all the three uh, uh, field of our block Or block in block zero six one there are three producing field one is lantel lando and pili I will not go into this detail but this was the this block was developed in four phases first lantel was developed in second phase it was the enhancement of the uh, uh, gas handling capacity at lantel platform in phase third lando field was developed and in last phase pld field was developed I will not go into detail and this is a subsea layout of our block. So you can see black line and red line. Black line is the flow line which connect uh, wells to the all uh, all this line on the seabeds. So this black line connect well to the platform. These are flow flow lines through which uh, gas and condensate being transported. And this red line are the umbilical line. Umbilical line which connect uh, well to the platform. And this line is the control line. Umbilical cable actually is a multi-function hose or cable which carry data, electrical cables, 
and injection lines. So the, through this umbilical, even we can inject uh, chemical also in the well, and we can control the well. We can open the well. We can shut the well through these umbilical lines from the platform. So this is a subsea layout of the block. This is photograph of the lantern platform, a block 061. Platform is only, you can see only above the sea level. All other things like wells, flow line, umbilical are at the seabed. Next is the roll up country manager. I'm skipping this because uh, there is no need to. And these are the some pictures of VIP visit in Vietnam. During this visit, I represented ONGC Videsh and was involved in the bilateral discussion and pending issue of ONGC Videsh with the petroleum regulator and government of Vietnam. And these are the occasions where you can take up the bilateral issue at the highest level. And they have a huge impact also. And sometimes the problem is resolved very, very quickly. I'll share with you one incident. We, we were facing a problem of gas allocation in the NCSP pipeline. And because of this issue, we are not able to meet our annual target. I raised this issue during both the bilateral meeting during the visit of His Excellency President of India and His Excellency Vice President of India. And you will surprise to know that few days after the meeting, PV gas increased our quota and they are still maintaining as per the production capacity of our block. And we overachieved our annual target in 19, 20, and 21 also. So these meetings are very important for us. So these are the, some of the photographs. This is the visit of then Raksha Mantri, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman. And this photograph is taken during a ceremony to celebrate first guest from our last field development, that was PLD. This field was discovered in 2016 and in brought to production in two years, in 2018, just in two years. And this is a photograph taken during an inauguration ceremony of construction of a community center for the local people, CHAM community. And these community CHAM people are Indian origin people settled in central Vietnam. And these people had migrated during the Champa dynasty. Actually, every year ONGC Videsh does a CSR activity near their area of operation in every project. Under CSR scheme, ONGC Videsh sponsored a construction, a community center for the cultural activity of CHAM community. And we constructed this community center in one year, one year. And the total cost of the construction was about 7.7 .7 million, which will come around 5.5 crore. So this is an inauguration and this is a handing over ceremony. Here you can see the People's Committee Chairman, our Ambassador, our Consulate General, everyone was were present. People's Committee Chairman, you can, in our system, it is equivalent to Chief Minister of the State. So these are the, some other photographs. Okay, thank you. So I hope I have completed in time. Mr. Dan, thank you. This is from all from our side. And okay, sir. Can we take some questions now? Because yes, yes, our yes. has sent many questions. Since time is limited, so I am taking few questions only. So, should we start the question round? Yes, yes, yes. Fine. Okay, uh, sir. The first question from our viewer is: uh, Since the government control is high in production sharing contract. As compared to concession contract, mm -hmm. why production sharing contract is used more frequently? Why production contract is uh, used more frequently? Yes, the viewer want to know. Yeah, first, actually, this all depends on the physical re regime of the country. In every contract, if you compare concession contract and production sharing contract, almost the ultimate take is similar because in production uh, concession contract. There is a high amount of royalty. So those governments who do not want to go into nitty gritty of the contract, like in production sharing contract, cost is since cost is recoverable, government has to be very vigilant to verify the cost for, from the contractor side. Okay. So that's why that's why I mean, but in the PSE the royalty is very less. 
Yes, sir. So that's that's why people prefer to go for. But I'll share one a uh, recent development in Indian uh, petroleum industry. Few years back, now DJ has changed from production sharing. Contract no name is production sharing, but now they have changed to revenue sharing. They do not want to go for profit petroleum. Now government is asking to give you the proportion of revenue at the beginning of the production. and they are not going to bother about what is the cost and other thing because there is already litigation with the reliance and other uh, contractor with the dgh because of this cost recovery issue only so now they have changed from cost recovery to revenue sharing so now they are preferring revenue sharing contract revenue sharing in india only okay. but other other part of the world it is again in vietnam it is still profit sharing because here government okay. can control the cost and monitor the cost but in india now they are feeling that it is difficult to control the cost and verify the cost so it is better go for the revenue sharing at the top level beginning of the production after contractor has to give how much revenue he will share going to share with the government so now after that government has not bother about the uh, what is the cost of the um, equipment and other things okay so next question from one of the our viewer is Which type of contract ONGC more preferred while doing operation in international countries? Not ONGC. You can say that I have already uh, presented a uh, comparative chart. In chart, you can see that 50 percent country of the world prefer PSC because in PSC everything is balanced. There is a balance of risk also, and there is balance of profit also. In concession, yeah. there is no guarantee of uh, cost recovery, but in PSC you have a guarantee of cost recovery. So you have to only only take the risk in the exploration stage. After that, there is no risk because after that you know the how how much resource is there and how much is going to be you are going to produce. So on that basis, you run an economic model and you decide that it is better to go for the production sharing rather than to go to concession or the REC. REC actually no contractor want to REC in exploration stage. Some contractor yeah. goes to go for development stage or production stage. So NGC prefer PSC, not concession or RSC. Because okay, because sir. of RSC, we are already suffering in one of our discovery in Iran. It's still for four five year we are negotiating, but we are not able to close the deal. Okay, sir. So uh, one of the viewer want to ask that uh, how to get job in NGC with this limited. The process is different from ONGC Limited or not? No, ONGC business employee, every employee of ONGC business is employee of ONGC only. They come mm -hmm. here on deputation in ONGC business, and ONGC business further they have a system. They advertise the post for the overseas posting. You can apply, get through interview, and if you are selected, then you will post it overseas also. But all the employee, regular employee of ONGC business are employee of ONGC only. So you have to come through NGC. OB. If you want to come in OBL, you have to come through NGC only. Okay. So uh, the next and the last question I want to ask is the time is limited. Uh, the changing behavior of oil and gas sector before the pandemic and after pandemic. Before the pandemic and after the very <laughs> tricky question. Uh, it is difficult. Difficult uh, during the pandemic. After the day. pandemic it is i think there is some advantage also now people can understand that they can do all the business meetings conferences etc online so i think this is a advantage yeah before this is the advantage uh, before covid everything was physical you have to travel a lot and you get only minimum time for the actual meeting and everything now you can uh, from your desk you can attend any type of meeting any type of webinar so this is a advantage from my point of view uh, after covid Uh, there is one our institution also education issue we can raise the expert like you as far as possible with the it online will, meeting it will be cost saving time saving everything and you yeah. can share whatever you want and any time you can attend in obl perspective it is like now more better because we are having a different part of the world yes. so if our office want to <laughs> interact in a, suppose uh, this time So now it is uh, not able. They cannot do this time in the America or the. Um, uh, After pandemic, communication become more easy. Yeah. Now people have already experienced that this is easy and uh, more beneficial. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, sir. That's all for our side. So I want to thank you uh, for the speaking to our viewer, our student, and our faculty. Uh, the student and the viewer who have attended this webinar has enlightened by your knowledge, has get inside view of the all the contract type, how the foreign companies work, how inter uh, uh, ONGT Vidya Limited works in the Vietnam about uh, our Vietnam project also. So. We appreciate you making time in your busy schedule also. So thank you so much for interacting with us. Thank you, sir. In the end, I would like to say something about Dr. Asis Nagar. Yes, sir. I have yes, worked sir. under him and I learned a lot, not only okay. technical things, but other aspects also. And I always okay. admire him for his helpful attitude and try to follow to some extent uh, because I cannot follow fully. fully. And in the last, I would like to thank Parul University Management for inviting me for this seminar. Thank you very much. Everybody. We hope we thank will you. again meet in such type of webinar. We can also conduct. De de definitely, definitely. If okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay.